We're about two months into 2020, and the first major phones of the year are already here. This year, Samsung unleashed a trio of new flagships in its S20 series, and for the first time, it introduced a souped-up Ultra variant alongside the regular S20 and S20+. Plus. The S20 Ultra is big and beefy, although with a starting price of $1,400, it's also hella expensive. It does offer intriguing features though, like a triple camera setup that can shoot at 108 megapixels and also zoom up to 100 times. The S20 Ultra's feature and specs list is long and impressive, but are the updates useful enough to justify dropping all that money? There are a few things you should consider, the first of which is the Ultra's size. Holy crap, is it huge. As my colleague Chris Velasco so eloquently put it, the S20 Ultra is a chunky boy. Thick with seven Cs. With a 6.9 inch screen and a very dense build, the Ultra is the largest of the S20 family and feels almost excessively big. After just a day of testing it, my left thumb felt sore. My arm ached too, and I could never last more than 10 minutes of furious scrolling through my favorite subreddits on the Ultra. It has a lot of fun. To be fair, the S20 Ultra is only slightly larger than the iPhone 11 Pro Max, which has a 6.5 inch screen. At 222 grams, the Ultra is noticeably heavier than the OnePlus 70 Pro, which is 206 grams. Even the Note 10 Plus 5G, which has a slightly smaller 6.8 inch screen, weighs a lot less at 198 grams. All I'm saying is, if you're already used to a big phone, you might not mind the S20 Ultra's size and heft so much. But if you prefer smaller devices and are considering the S20 Ultra, you might want to weigh your options carefully. If you are considering the Ultra, it is probably because of its cameras. They're the most notable thing about the new flagships. The S20 Ultra has a tri-camera setup with a primary 108 megapixel sensor and a 12 megapixel ultra-wide option that captures a 123 degree field of view. The most interesting of the lot though is the 48 megapixel telephoto lens folded into the chunky bump on top of this already giant phone's behind. Thanks to the bigger, sharper sensors, the S20 Ultra should take brighter, more colorful, and clearer pictures than Samsung's previous flagships. But the company's image processing algorithms are still pretty aggressive and seem to soften details. Edges of buildings lack the definition you'd find on pictures taken with a Pixel 4 or an iPhone 11 Pro. By default, the 108 MP camera snaps pictures at 12 megapixels using a technology Samsung calls Nona Binning. Basically, it combines nine pixels into one on the sensor level to make them much bigger. Technically, that should result in brighter shots with less noise, but whether it's due to Samsung's algorithms or something else in the processing, the images just weren't very crisp, whether you shoot at 108 or 12 megapixels. Ultimately, the S20 Ultra's pictures don't look that much better than the S10 Plus's. The improvements are minor at best. The aggressive software also models up shots in live focus and night modes, which are meant to improve your portraits and low light photos respectively. I've been spoiled by my Pixel, so the artificial blur that Samsung applies in live focus just looks bad. Google and even Apple are far better at recognizing outlines of people and applying bokeh that looks more realistic and natural. Though I do see an improvement in low light photography and night mode on the S20 Ultra compared to the S10 Plus, I still prefer Google's offering as it is more effective in noise reduction and in darker conditions. Besides the sharper sensors, the standout feature of the S20s is what Samsung calls space zoom. On the S20 and S20 Plus, this lets you get up to 30 times closer to your subject. On the Ultra, you can go in up to 100 times, which honestly is hard to find useful unless you're an amateur sleuth or a paparazzo. I've used the Ultra mostly to zoom in on buildings or faraway signs, and when you go beyond 10 times, the image quality drops drastically. As with any other camera, Every tiny movement is magnified when you're that much zoomed in, and at 100 times, it is nearly impossible to frame up a shot without a tripod and have it be still. That makes it hard to aim, although Samsung includes a helpful visual guide at the top right or left corner of the viewfinder that shows where you are in the scene. When you finally do line up a shot and take the picture, 
Almost anything captured at Beyond 10 Times is a muddy, noisy mess. People have debated the ethics of such a feature and its potential for becoming a tool for a snooping. I will say that in my time testing the Ultra, I've zoomed in on countless windows and high-rise buildings, and I haven't seen anything incriminating. Mostly I've encountered potted plants, curtains, or random ornaments. But once, I shot up from the sidewalk into an apartment where a woman was having a conversation on the phone and looking out. Her face filled up the entire viewfinder at a mere 10 times zoom. And while I'm sure that she didn't know I was that up close, it felt like she was staring right at me. I immediately felt uncomfortable and I put the phone down. Yes, space zoom is potentially creepy. Should Samsung have made it? I'm not sure, since the quality of the resulting zoomed in pictures aren't that great. But ultimately, whether this becomes an invasive feature boils down to how you use it. And the most persistent stalkers and paparazzi are going to find ways to snoop whether or not the Ultra exists. Moving on to a more fun addition to the camera experience, the new single take mode. When you press the shutter button in this mode, the S20 captures a variety of shots and videos from all the cameras. You'll have to hold the phone for a few seconds and on-screen alerts will prompt you to move around to get more interesting angles. When you're done, voila, the S20 spits out about 10 variations of your shot. I like that single take serves up options that I wouldn't have otherwise thought to take, like a monochrome version or a looping video set to a cheesy soundtrack. But it's not something I'd use all the time since it's best for moving subjects and I don't shoot those a lot. Parents of human and fur babies, for example, might find this more worthwhile. Another thing I didn't find that useful was 8K video recording. Like Space Zoom, this is another feature that's really there for Samsung to say, hey, we did this technologically impressive thing. Thanks to the S20's Snapdragon 865 processor, it can record the super high-res footage without limits, so long as your device has enough storage and battery. I took some 8K clips of NYC streets and the Ultra started to heat up after about a minute. It wasn't too hot, but the temperature difference was noticeable. The problem with 8K video isn't so much shooting it as it is trying to find somewhere to play it back in that resolution. The S20 Ultra's screen is just 2K, so watching it on that display won't give you the full impact, and edges of buildings just look distorted because they're so sharp. Samsung's solution is to make it easy for you to cast your video to one of its 8K TVs, which are about as easy to find in the wild as a panda bear. You can also upload it to YouTube, but again, you'll have to find a super high resolution screen to watch it on after to really appreciate the quality. This is more a future-proof feature than a really useful tool today. I did like the improved super steady stabilization though. My footage turned out very smooth despite me tripping while walking on an uneven sidewalk. Although watching 8K videos on the S20 Ultra is a silly idea, it's still a lovely canvas. The cityscapes I shot looked crisp and colorful on the Ultra's 6.9 inch screen, even in sunlight. I also enjoyed watching a couple of 4K HDR videos, as well as endless Instagram stories about my friends' exciting lives. Scenes of exotic destinations and episodes of The Bachelor also popped. The Ultra's almost all-screen front made the viewing experience more immersive and inviting. One of the highlights on the S20 series is their 120Hz displays, which allows them to refresh much faster than other phones. Since so much of my activity online involves scrolling, whether it's my Instagram or Twitter feeds or a random Reddit binge, I thought this new feature would be a huge improvement. But my eyes quickly adjusted to the updated refresh rate, and although I appreciated the smoother scrolling, I didn't find myself missing it when I went back to my Pixel 3. The Pixel 4, with its 90Hz screen, was more than fast enough for me. Still, if I wanted a sharper resolution or to save my battery, I could revert to 60Hz speeds. The S20 Ultra only supports 120Hz at 1080p. I've been a big believer of millimeter wave 5G since I learned about it in 2015, because the promised speeds were seriously impressive. 
When I did manage to latch onto a signal here in New York, the rewards were huge. I hit up to 800 megabits per second download speeds according to speed test when connected to a 5G node in Manhattan. A 4K video that took me 13 minutes to download over 4G LTE came through in just 13 seconds on millimeter wave. Uploads, on the other hand, hit slower speeds of about 50 Mbps since Verizon is still using its LTE network for all uploads. That means posting your Instagram stories or YouTube videos on the carrier won't benefit from the speed boost just yet. One of the biggest concerns about technologies like millimeter wave 5G or a screen that refreshes faster is their impact on battery life. To allay our concerns, Samsung stuffed a whopping 5,000 milliamp hour cell into the Ultra, and honestly, I don't know if we needed that. I set my screen to 120 hertz and used the S20 Ultra for a ton of photo taking and Instagramming, along with my usual slew of messaging, and the battery lasted about one and a half days. On our battery test, the S20 Ultra lasted 11 and a half hours, which is surprisingly shorter than the Pixel 4 XL. It does line up with the S10 Plus and outlast the iPhone 11 Pro Max on general use though. I mostly use the S20 Ultra for messaging friends and coworkers, scrolling through and posting to Instagram and Twitter, as well as taking a ton of photos and videos. The Snapdragon 865 chipset held up well in general, and the phone only stalled once when I was trying to switch camera modes while the video was still saving. To push the S20 Ultra harder, I played a couple rounds of Fortnite while recording the screen, and then quickly tried to edit that video. That went smoothly, as is to be expected of a brand new flagship. Since it is a Galaxy S flagship after all, the Ultra also offers features from older stable mains, like an in-display fingerprint sensor, reverse wireless charging, and Bixby routines, you know, in case you found that useful. You'll also get the standard set of preloaded apps from Samsung, Google, and Microsoft. But for some reason, Netflix and Facebook also came installed. That's fine, most people use these apps. But for those who don't, or if you're against Facebook on principle like I am, the bad news is you can't uninstall either of these. Your only option is to disable them, which removes them from your app drawer and silences notifications. That's a relatively minor gripe about a phone that is otherwise very impressive. The S20 Ultra is proof of what we can get in a premium smartphone if all we cared about were crazy specs. And for people who care only about getting the best of the best, the S20 Ultra is an excellent device. The rest of the world might be more concerned about practical questions like, is this a worthy upgrade for my two-year-old phone? Do I need something I can easily use with one hand? Or can I stand using something this heavy to read on the plane? For those looking to upgrade from an older device, bear in mind that Samsung cut the prices for the S10 series, which are still a big jump up from older flagships. The S20 Ultra starts at $1,400, which is the same price as two Galaxy S10e's with some change. For comparison, the smallest S20 starts at $1,000, which is what the iPhone 11 Pro costs at the same level. If you don't need the most advanced phone available, the S20 Ultra is almost certainly overkill. Few of us need anything this overpowered. It's hard to imagine situations where the S20 or S20 Plus wouldn't be enough. If you have the cash to burn, you're getting plenty of everything that matters. Just remember that you don't need to spend this much for a great smartphone. For reviews and analyses on all the other smartphones and devices you could possibly buy, make sure to subscribe to Engadget.